This is Archetypal Hour. I am your host, Adam, and I'm joined by some amazing people here live in the container. And uh, thank you for anyone who's joining asynchronously. And as usual, just want to kick us off with this question of what's in the field, what shapes seem to be shaping your, maybe another way to put this is maybe what shapes seem to be maybe shaping your perspective these days? What forms seem to be forming that perspective? Perspective. What um, patterns seem to be patterning? And what moves seem to be sort of prevalent for you or moves that you want to make that might have uh, an archetype attached to it? I've got a couple things that came up in the broom that I thought could be interesting to chew over in this space, but I don't want to do anything until I kind of hear what's, what's alive in you all. What archetypes are coming up for you or maybe you're on the periphery? Yeah, any imagery that's been really striking to you or um, anything at all? Opening it up. Honestly? <laughs> Honestly? <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like... Honestly. Uh, <laughs> Honestly. Um, <laughs> Psychonaut said monster trucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like last um, last Sunday's archetypal hour about Saturn has like reverberated um, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. really beautifully into my field. Um, like I feel like it kind of like set me up this week to I felt like I was just like communing with Saturn like the whole time. That's amazing. Yeah, uh, I did see really, that. Yeah. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. I was gonna say I did see you saying like I, I saw the love that you were pouring out on your social media for Saturn, <laughs> like, and I was like, that's really cool that uh, she's still in that Saturnian energy. Yeah. Are there any anything more you want? Maybe uh, because it's archetypal, I have to start with this. I guess any like images or metaphors or symbols that might help describe the the energy that you were feeling or that you were tapping into with saturn this week mm. Mm. nothing's coming to me like immediately when you mm. ask that so what would you say about like like what parts or aspects of Saturn were feeling especially juicy to you this week or maybe more notice you notice them more? I guess I was, it just like felt timely for me because I realized that, um, like my Saturn return ended like a year ago, almost like to the T. And mm. so, it was just interesting to have like this retrospective perspective on like what I had been moving through during my Saturn return. Um, and it's funny because it's like, well, yeah, I think that it makes sense that like a Saturn return would be digested over like a longer period of time, you know? Like, yeah. The fact that it was um a year ago and it was like, oh, now it's like beginning to kind of like it's almost like um the dust is settling or something, you know. Mhm. Mm that does make sense to me that it would take a little bit of more time. I'm curious and I think what's one one thing I've always appreciated about like some commentary and certainly things I've experienced too with Saturn is like that the integration, the changes that Saturn can bring are, are like really long lasting. And right. I'm wondering, like, and then I think that year, that year out kind of helps you see like, wow, you know, I really did make some big moves since that yeah. Saturn return. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to like share my appreciation for that container. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm-hmm. And if there's anything more you feel like sharing about like anything that did feel like it was like a lasting thing that came from that little bit of a retrospective that yeah. feels like that you want to give, give your, uh, um, give it up to Saturn. I'm 
definitely <laughs> giving you the space to do so. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And Psychonaut, I saw you sell monster trucks, but I feel like that we were making a joke before we hit record about um, if anyone grew up, especially in the States, with certain radio shows, the Sunday, 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 the sort of monster truck rally ads. Maybe monster truck really is in your field, Psychonaut. Um, only, only for that brief moment of time. Yeah. You brought me back to my childhood. <laughs> um, you know, but, but to be honest with you, um, I, I've been thinking about, uh, the, uh, the star, uh, recently. Um, mm. and that's Ooh. not too far, that's not too far off from the monster truck. Uh, I, I feel, I feel like the star and the monster truck embody a lot of the same energy. <laughs> I I'm gonna I'm gonna choose to accept this without any hints of sarcasm and say, hmm, I'm gonna really play with this. Okay, what do monster trucks and star have in common? Let's think about these overlaps. So for me personally, um what um due due to being disabled, I go through certain periods of um just hardship on kind of a cyclical basis and um when the temperatures change it's one of those times and walking out of that um it has a lot of the energy that i feel that the star um embodies um Mm -hmm. yeah despite the fact i've been here before it feels like the first time every time so (laughs) interesting and i'm really sorry to hear that um Wow. And the star does, you know, there is something I will say when the star shows up in my, in my own pulls, I always feel a little bit better and lighter with the star. Do you have that sense too, Saiga? Like the star somehow is a very reassuring archetype for me. Yeah. And it's, um, it's never too much or too little. It's always kind of, you know, just right. Um, <clears throat> But um, it 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 is it it always is a little unfamiliar, right? At the same time, um, kind of gently pushing in a new direction, um, pushing new boundaries, um, which is why I uh, have such an affinity for it. I think um, it's never boring, right? It's never oh. um, a sort of humdrum, sort of pleasant, good or or whatever, but always something new, driving towards something new. Much like the monster truck. <laughs> Sorry. I'm done That's now. okay. You found on the, the synchronicity, the, the ability to, to, to over and also to overcome obstacles, right? The monster truck can overcome just about anything and put in front of it. Sure. Just like the star. I love what you're saying though about the star. Like the quality that I the kind of vibe I got when you were describing was like almost like this otherworldly part of the star. Like like this really like unknowable part of it. Mm. Sure. Sure. Definitely. And, and I think, I think it's um, more, more than, more than just um, something, something, mm, something positive, right. Um, more than, more than just um, like a change of faith or, or, or a uh, change of fate rather. Um, but um, something much deeper on, on sort of a level of like purpose, like life purpose. Um, rather than just something very cursory, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I want to open it up to anyone else that might have thoughts or things that are popping up hearing, hearing the way Psychonaut's talking about the star right now. And also, while, while I do that, while we hold for anyone to jump in, Psycho, I am curious also, like, if you were, and you kind of have already answered this, but if you were to, like, hone in on, on what the star does for you, or, or how, how, the, how that relationship with the star might support you in this transition that you're dealing with, or these circumstances you're dealing with right now. The, the star, to me, is sort of... Um you know, the, um, the passageway, um, to the other side, um, 
it's um it's uh, and, and i don't i don't know that this is where the symbolism of this card came from um but i assume it means like a guiding star in the night um and or perhaps that's just me projecting my experience onto it right um but that's very much so the way that i see it it's it's sort of um this the a passageway or the guiding star or or something um that appears in order to um let the practitioner know that um you know the the other side is coming right mm. yeah and is, is agreeing. yeah Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt nope. you, Adam. Sorry. Um, Psychonaut, when you say other side, do you, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> I just got a new phone, and it's very difficult to unmute myself with it. Um, the, um, um, it, it, it's it's hard to really put a, a finger on it because, like I was saying before, it's it's always something different. Um, but if if I had to kind of wrap some words and symbols around it, I I, I think I would say um, something not just not just material, like you know, because there there are there are changes in one's life where it's like. Um, you're going to find $5 on the ground and that'll be really swell, you know, which, which is great. Everyone loves finding $5 on the side of the sidewalk. Right. But, um, it, it more, more base, more, um, deep in, in terms of the purpose that one finds in, in, in life on a very base level. Okay. I wasn't which, sure if you meant totally like different. other side as in like spirit realm. I, I think I think that's a part of it though because I think that's where that kind of that kind of stuff stems from. I know. Right? I like as um, I said it, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 we can we can think of this as following the the star in the night sky as well, right? This metaphor still works because that is you know the the other world, right? Um, it's where mm. it finds representation is in the stars. Mm. It's. It's funny though, when you were talking about this, and maybe I had heard this song this weekend, so it wasn't like completely out of nowhere. I heard the Doors song "Break On Through" to the other side come in up from me. <laughs> um, I think partly what also comes up when I hear the way you're talking about the star is, um, like lately, uh, no, like Nobu's been doing some great stuff in "Why Am I Like This?" Especially, I feel like um, talking about like. The different perspectives and sort of like the sealed off astral sort of collective consciousness of humanity and then sort of this you know beyond that is getting into you know maybe the the milky way galaxy and that galactic sort of perspective and then beyond that there's this like further out cosmic perspective and um and you know i, I think some of what i like of what he's been sharing is sort of like the difficulty of actually breaking through that human sort of layer of collective consciousness that sealed off astral out further and i don't know for some reason the way you're describing it makes me feel like it's related to some of those themes that nobu has been talking about where it's like the star is is that those those um those higher level cosmic perspectives or energies that are outside of like our little humanic humanities like astral seal as as um to use sort of nobu's language and is bringing in different different energies, different ways of seeing that I think, like you said, in Psychonaut, like maybe add some of the perspective that is really needed to help us manage our lives better or see our what's going through our lives in a different perspective. I don't know. That's what's coming up for me. I'm curious if that if that resonates at all with what you're saying, Psychonaut. Yeah, I, and I, I was there for the one that you're uh, referencing. Oh, yeah. um, I I, 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 it was absolutely fantastic, but it, it was like anything when, when Nobo really starts going, you know, I have, I, it's just like, <clears throat> I feel like a sponge, like a saturated sponge. And I'm just like, <laughs> okay, I need to sit and I need to understand this. And then he just keeps going and going. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> like, um, <clears throat> this, this, this dude don't miss. Um, but, um, 
Yeah, no, and, and, and this is the interesting thing, especially in, in terms of the archetype, um, because um, when, when Nobu speaks of this, this other language, right, um, for me, what, what this means and, and the, quote, difficulty of understanding it, you know, I, I, I think that um, we, we have issues integrating um, this into mm -hmm. our um, symbolic, um, sh the symbolic structures of our mind, right? Um, I think I think there's a lot to be said for um, sort of translating, right, and and making yeah. maps um, and fields around what all of that looks like um, in order to um, easy more easily translate that um, because I, I I get I get this sense that um, it's it's a very you know dense sort of undertaking um and if we do think about the star not only as the metaphor of the gateway right or as the star in the guiding light uh guiding night rather but both right as the gateway and as the star in the night then we can start to see um we can start to develop sort of a framework around this you know uh, cosmic language or cosmic symbolism or you know what wh or whatever you want to call it Ooh, ooh! I love that. Oh, I see Hoda put poetry snaps in the chat. Yeah, that did feel very well articulated. And wow, yeah, I just sort of love like how you're describing where it's like she's both sort of the way and the way to the guidance, and the and then the guidance, or the way to this sort of cosmic knowing, but also the cosmic knowing itself, maybe. And I love. Also, what I see in, in the chat here, Hoda mentioned that the star is very dreamer coded. I know you're driving, so you might not be able to come off mute, but I'd love to hear more if you're able to, Hoda. Because that feels right. Whew. Hoda, are you speaking? I see you off mute, but I can't hear you. I don't know if it's my phone. Oh, okay. Mic issues. Yeah, thank you. No worries at all. No worries at all. I have been there too many times. I don't want to lose sight, too, like, while we're, while we're waiting for Hoda, maybe, on the star. I also just want to say, like, I really think what you're saying about this integration and, like, the work it takes to kind of like build up the mapping in your psyche to integrate new information is really, really interesting. And that might be really something interesting to flesh out and see what other people's perspectives are on that. How so, Adam? What's well, going through here? Yeah, it's just that like, you know, it's one of those things too. I feel like we got to make sure Nobu watches this because we're talking a bunch about it. But like, I know how he likes to talk about like sort of the conceptual or the self-conceptualizing self and then like the preconceptual, right? This sort of distinction. Um, but how I do feel like a lot of times even gnosis that's coming from that preconceptual place in order for it to carry across to another person's psyche or even just like be planted and tended well in that person's psyche. There are usually in my, maybe it's just because of the, I have a show called Archetype Hour, but like, having archetypes or shapes or symbols that are in your own psyche or developing those new shapes or symbols even though the gnosis is preconceptual it sort of still relies on some conceptual help in order to like actually take root in your psyche and be something that helps inform your worldview yeah i was actually thinking about this in the shower earlier <laughs> there's like some <laughs> And it was, it's funny because like, I feel like for, I guess for some people, like maybe their, um, their journey has to do with like letting go of concepts. And I think actually like at this point for me, like in my journey, I would love to like actually have more concepts, like more conceptual information available so that 
I have like a, I guess I'm just like thinking about like having like a fuller basket so that like I can reach into it and pull from to like translate things. You know what I mean? So I think there really is something to that. As much as I, I don't know, there's a way where like, um, I don't know, I feel like I really have a lot of reverence for like the preconceptual, but I definitely agree with what you're saying. I like this basket. I like the basket. I don't know why. For some reason, it reminded me of there was this old, there was a show called um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Like an improv show. And uh, improv has been coming up in my field lately. And uh, there's like a, a couple gags where they would pull out props and they'd have to work. Yes. <laughs> right? That's kind of the vibe I got with sort of like, yeah. <laughs> maybe I do need to update my basket with some new symbols, archetypes, conceptual frameworks that yeah. not wed myself to new dogma but to have some new stuff that when things come through or when people are explaining maybe there's maybe those other existing shapes will help me better understand what this is or make make something new um with all these different ingredients yeah that makes a lot of sense to me mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and psycho you want to say more about this uh, i see what you're putting in the chat about like this mapping territory right I think it's kind of what you were, I find that length interesting too. Um, well, you know, <laughs> um, this, this kind of stuff gets like a little, <laughs> we're getting into the territory where it is a little bit hard to, to, to kind of conceptualize what, what exactly happened is happening here. But I, I think it was specifically Anna's spaces when um, we would go back and forth on um, uh, tarot um, and what these archetypes meant and um, the, the depth of your knowledge around those things um, sort of led me to um, think, uh, well, this Hold my headphones out. <laughs> um, it, it led me to believe that you had some sort of <clears throat> an understanding of um, myth and maybe even young um, and um, those sorts of topics and that um, we would eventually end up um, going back and forth on this quite a bit because this this is this is so central to my work and my writing as well as, you know, how, how do we utilize? Right. How do we. Um, I think I think um, intentionally utilize myth, archetypal consciousness, um, and 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 create um, these new, um, you know, whatever you want to call them, maps or uh, fields of consciousness or um, symbolic structure is kind of the terminology that I prefer, um, and, and and do that consciously, you know, and actively as active participants rather than allowing, you know. Um, the other the the cultural programmers you know the whomever right and and kind of fill us up with their understanding their maps their archetypes and um take hold of that process um as people uh, I, th I think that's a that's a very promising um sort of uh field of study um for the future of humanity right well i'm definitely biased and i agree <laughs> I'm curious if others find that to be as important. I also will say that I, I always like, yeah, you're right about like the sort of counter programming, but I feel like also a lot of the programming and conditioning is so just based on all of the entertainment industry too. Like I do feel like the archetypes of fiction take up a lot of our residence in our psyches. And this is, you know, we live in an era of memes, right? Um, and those take up a lot of, those are archetypes too. Hoda says, I yep. agree. And I think perceptual bridges are necessary. Oh, sorry, Psychonaut. No, and this is exactly what we talked about last time with fiction, right? When we were talking about yeah. um, the fool, the joker, the clown, et cetera. Um, the role that fiction plays in, in forming sort of the collective unconscious around these ideas. Yes. Absolutely. 
So we've done some great stuff on the star. Hold if you're if your mic's working now, if you have more to add to the star, please do. But while we wait for that, any other um any other uh archetypes or things that people want to add to the container that have been feeling kind of resonant or in the field, and I'll share one in a second. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Hoda. Yes, weaving archetypes has been present for Hoda, she says. That's been That's present pretty. for me, actually. Interesting, like the weaving piece. Oh, and, and Hoda's yeah. just hair, too. <laughs> Oh my God, Love I saw things. it. It looks so good, Hoda. Nice work. Love Thanks. I'm so impressed. <laughs> Six hours. Yeah, you know, I was... Um... Yeah. Sorry, Adam. No, please. <laughs> uh, I feel like I've been interrupting you. No. I, I Like I said, I, I, I didn't do a disclaimer this week, but I don't mind it. I really don't. This, I'm you used have to said it. that. <laughs> Um, yeah, when I was meditating last night, um, I was like getting, uh, I was getting an image of like breathe, like, um, threading like a needle, like my breath being like threading a needle. Mm. So I feel like mm. that relates to looping. <laughs> and you said you were connecting the breath too. You said the breath was like threading a needle. Yeah, it was like something about like the the in it was like i mean i've never it's funny because it's like i don't sew so i don't know why this image came to me wow but i guess i was just thinking about like sometimes how you can like kind of tune in to like the precision and breath and it just felt like there was like this textural kind of like it felt like threading a needle Ooh. or like yeah it was really cool that's amazing Wow, just sitting with that for a moment. Yeah, the one that was so one that was coming up for me, and I I I feel like oh, I feel bad name dropping because she just joined the room, but someone had just joined the room recently, and was uh, I think we had asked them kind of what was in there uh, up for them right now, and they were talking about like their surrender journey or like that they really spending time with surrender. And I know I was like, oh, yeah, I've definitely been in that space. And I think, Anna, I think maybe you also sent something about that. But I was thinking, like, you take something like surrender, right? To me, it felt a really good one, possibly, because maybe all of us have been in part of that journey. And sort of like what Psychonaut was saying about, like, you know, these archetypes can really help us through th certain things. You know, they, they have different resonance in different stages in their life. And I was trying to think, I'm like... What types of archetypes maybe have you all either found useful in your surrender journey or as you sort of work on that particular aspect? Or maybe what are some archetypes you feel like could be useful that maybe you haven't really engaged with in like a relational or deep contemplative way or, or um, prayerful way, but maybe would be interested in if surrender is something that's kind of on your, on your mind? I just want to hold space if anyone has any archetypes that come to mind for them on this question of like working on this idea of surrender. And feel free to jump in with any comments on surrender too, by the way. I think it's a really powerful thing to talk about. Hmm. This is not easy, though, is it? Or maybe it's just not that interesting. But oh, here you go, Anna. Please. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was just gonna ask you the question too, like if there was anything that comes up for yeah. you about surrender. Only because I know sometimes when I ask a question, it's hard for me to answer. But like when somebody asks me a question, <laughs> something about the mirroring works. <laughs> no, it's true. I appreciate it. I actually did it just. This time, so I didn't catch myself off guard. This kind of question came up to me in the shower, so I did ask myself. So I have, okay. I have 
but I've been sitting with it, you know, it, and yeah. that's why I said it's not easy. Like it did not come right away from me. So I'm going to hold some more space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Psycho. <laughs> I'm too star monster truck right now to think about surrender. <laughs> yeah, man. That. I mean, I feel like maybe the star have might have something interesting to say about surrender. Maybe. That's an interesting I one. Think... Monster truck, no. <laughs> Go ahead, Anne. I was going to say, I do feel like the star is related to surrender. What, um, I feel... what, yeah. what about the star has that vibe to you? Mm. Well, first of all, I know I'm thinking about the image of the star. And, you know, there's a pool of water. And there's like a person pouring water. And I often think of the element of water when I think about surrender. So that's one thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Like certainly that water is going to flow down. There's no... There's like a surrender to like the gravity of it that's coming up for me. Mm-hmm. With yeah. water. Yeah, gravity is a great word too for it. Hmm. And Hoda says, I guess I think about an aspect of peace being there with me around times in my life where surrender is important. Anything more you can say about that peace aspect? Oh, sorry. Second, I like you were. Oh no, hold up, please. You start. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's all right, Adam. I know facilitating me like that. It's like who to pick on, who to call on. Um, <laughs> but yes, I was gonna say that. I guess, uh, yeah, peace comes up for me when it comes to surrender because I feel like it's a sense perception that for me often precedes like the act of surrendering. Um. And then also maybe like to color in some context, I'll say like the thing that I'm usually surrendering is like my ego. So, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, I'm like, I don't know if y'all relate to that, but um, yeah, I feel like I have, I'm just kind of also remembering moments where I've tried to surrender my ego's desires to like a larger sort of orchestration. And I struggled because like, I didn't feel at peace or like I didn't, feel like part like parts of myself felt like they were resisting um surrendering those aspects of my ego it's like why like why do I have to throw these parts of myself away or why do I feel like these parts of myself have to be thrown away and I realized that um those feelings of like disturbance and irritation find me whenever I yeah like whenever I'm not at peace <laughs> with whatever it is whatever circumstances in front of me and that's calling for like my presence. If I find that I'm struggling to surrender my ego, then usually that points to me that I need to like zoom out a little bit and like find maybe more. And it sounds like I'm speaking to buzzwords, but it, these are like processes to me. So like, like finding peace around having to surrender parts of my ego, I feel like yeah, it feels like they're processes that like go hand in hand, at, at least for me personally. And I'm curious um, if any of you guys can like, yeah, relate to that. Mm. I also want to just clarify one thing. It sounded like you also said that there has been like a very felt sensation of peace that sometimes will... Um, show up before sort of an opportunity to surrender did i hear that correctly yeah yeah absolutely adam i feel like that's the other side of it too um yeah um, yeah so i wonder if that's what you're picking up on well i kind of I, yeah i felt like you were saying both like mm -hmm. that that surrender is like sometimes you'll sense that peace even before like the, the, as the surrender opportunity is coming to you and you kind of lean yes. into it. I also got the feeling like sometimes that does that, that resistance to surrender will come up strong too. And that also gives you this opportunity to be like, Hmm, what is it that I could maybe surrender here? Ashe. Yep. 
that captures it beautifully. Thank you for reflecting. Wow, no, that's beautiful. I love, I love both that uh, that you brought in both dimensions. And I'm seeing um, Julie says, "I'd be resisting surrendering, like my life depends on it sometimes." <laughs> but when I do surrender, it's usually followed with relief. Uh, uh, anything more you want to say about that, Julie? But I think I feel like I know what you're talking about. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, it is funny that resistance to surrendering, especially when it comes to that piece. Like, I feel like so many people's surrender journey, or maybe I should just speak for myself, does, like Hoda say, have to do with that ego self, right? Wow. Yeah, Lexi's... and I also... Please, Anna, please. I'm really on a roll today, aren't I? <laughs> I got to leave more space. It's all me. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, you, you're okay. good. You're good. You do you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I was just going to say that <laughs> oftentimes I, I feel like it's like the more resistance, the more juice. <laughs> Ooh. I, like, I know that's like very simplistic, but I do feel like that's true in my experience. Like I find like the more the more that I am resisting something, like, uh, the more, I guess, like, breakthrough potential there is. Because it's like, if you think about all the energy that it takes to resist something, it's like, the way that I think about it, because I, I feel like I work with resistance a lot. Um, there is something about, like, the direction of like where you're sending your energy where it's just like if you can find a way to like reroute it or like turn it in a different direction it's like you're there's so much potential there you know mm. like i think of resistance as just like all of this potential basically like all of this energy that's like waiting to be used you know yes yes and I love how you said, like, actually, sometimes when the resistance is highest, that's when there's actually the most opportunity for a big transformation or something big to be manifest with this energy. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, it works that way for me. Yeah. And I like, I feel like this is related to, like, the charge and that, that, that high charge does feel related to what Julie's saying here about how she says for her, that resisting usually feels fueled by fear, especially like fear of the unknown. So when I surrender, it's really me surrendering to and accepting the unknown that follows. Oof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to start taking notes so that I can follow up on all these, <clears throat> on all these different threads. <laughs> um, but um, it, so <clears throat> for clarification, um, my my positioning in regards to the star and surrender is just uh, one of um, my personal relationship to the archetype. Not that the archetype itself doesn't imply some sort of surrender. Um, it's just when the star comes to me, I'm like, oh, my God, fi fi finally, you know, <laughs> mm. um, and, and there's no resistance in that. But I think that one could um, perceive any of the archetypes um, in, in, in the context of surrender um, if one is resistant to that. And I think that this is where um, divinatory practice is so fucking important because we can mm. find what we are resisting and and mm. move with instead of against. Um, and then specifically in relation to the star, um, and I was talking about gravity and water and those sort of things. And one can perceive a lot of union um, within um this um the symbolism too uh, I, I think that's an important part of of the star um the water and the land the individual in the water um and and all of these different um sim uh, uh, symbolism that's occurring um i i generally perceive the water as the subconscious and then the land as the conscious or or the person as the ego right um sort of uh, a wash in um, in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Wow. Yes. 
I also, I really like how you said, like, really all the archetypes can have something to say about this. And I feel like that's true, too, because sometimes it's like surrendering to sort of these cosmic functions that these archetypes, that some of these archetypes are signifying or symbolizing. Hmm. I also want to go back up to something Lexi said here. It says, I kind of feel like surrender happens partly through my will and God's will. But like both is needed for it to happen, at least in my experience. I really like this idea of surrender, having something that, or like the act of being able to like cross the threshold and actually surrender, have this like blending of wills or this overlap of wills, the individual and the and God and God's will. Wow. Hmm. Thank you for bringing that in, Lexi. And I mean, I think this is why there are religious archetypes, because, you know, with the surrender, and especially with what, what was also talking about, like this one piece that I think Julie is really talking about, you know, about like accepting the unknown, or really just sort of accepting the sort of circumstances around us, um, is like why I think religious archetypes are often powerful for people, because they can be archetypes of surrendering to higher cosmic functioning or higher mysterious unknown machinations that you put some faith into as being aligned in a grander perspective if not maybe they're aligned with your immediate egoic <laughs> needs or uh desires yeah speaking of resistance um i think it was like i think it was last year that um, I had a dream about um, Jonah and the whale. Mm. And like, I never read, I I wasn't familiar with that story, but I just like woke up one morning with like the words, like Jonah and the whale, like in my head. And I was like, uh, okay, like I don't, I've never read this before. What is this about? And then uh. I like come to find out, like, I guess Jonah, like wasn't answering the call to God. Yep. And so then he was swallowed by a whale. <laughs> sure was. And yeah, because God was like, you need to like follow your assignment. Yes, he like, did. you need to like do what I sent you to do and like do your like prophet thing. And like that helped me a lot. I'll be honest. Like, looking up that story it was just funny because i was like wow this is like a biblical thing like I, it kind of like made me it, it like gave me some understanding um about yeah like what you were saying adam about how like these religious archetypes um can find like purpose and like how they can weave into people's lives like i've I was, I've like never been a person for like religious texts or anything, but yeah. I love that it showed up for you in a dream though. That's really powerful. And it's always, I always love when I hear stories like this, where the person is like, listen, this is not even a story I know nothing about. I don't remember anything, but here it is. And I'm going to follow up on this because it's just... I could just sense there was something there for me. And then to really get something really meaningful out of that story. And I do think Joe's a great archetype of surrender because he refuses <laughs> because he's terrified because being a prophet sucks. I mean, I, on the outside, yeah, there's some of us that are like, yeah, man, I want to be a prophet. Like, yeah, that's awesome. But if you read the stories of the prophets, shit sucks. It is not a pleasurable experience being a prophet. Like, it's never. Um, and so I understand why Jonah was trying to run away from that shit. But God's like, but you can't. This is who you are. <laughs> You're a prophet. Mm. Julie says, I feel like it's a pretty fine line. It takes skill to walk the line of surrender that's truly generative versus surrender that banishes responsibility for our own self journey. Whew. 
Also, I need to go buy a pie. BRB. That's amazing. Uh, I hope that pie is damn good. Um, whatever it ends up being. But I feel like you left us a nice little pie to think about. Because you're right. There is a... <laughs> I think what you're almost pointing to is sort of like when surrender is a cope. And as a Pisces, I've definitely used surrender as a cope. <laughs> I know I have. Like, oh, oh just give it up to God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> this is just how it is. This is, this is what God told me that I needed to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! Oh, this said AKA collapsing. Yeah, that sounds yeah. right for me. <laughs> and Lexus said, "Yeah, the latter kind of sounds like avoidance." I like collapse. Collab- I don't think I've heard that word used in this way, Hoda. Can you want? I don't know if you want to say more, but I like. I can like sort of feel what you're saying with that collapsing. <laughs> yeah, because I I was just thinking for the opportunity too, because I'm like, there's a part of I just was tuning into like times in. Um, my life and like times in my path where I've like collapsed into prayer and how Mm -hmm. like that didn't feel empowering for either me or like my idea of God either so (laughs) it's just kind of I'm kind of glad that you spoke to that idea or like the sense the, the felt sense that sometimes surrendering to something can kind of be like collapsing into it and feeling like there is like no other way except to like surrender to this possibility or or and sometimes too like people will say surrender when they really mean that their will was forced and it's mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. are you surrendering or like you being coerced by something to like collapse like or like lose the wind behind your beneath your wings or something um mm-hmm. behind something does that make sense it makes a lot of sense yeah. and the image I'm getting actually is from scripture, since it seems like it's coming up, is Isaiah in the throne room. And when Isaiah goes into the throne room, he collapses. And you could say, like, is he surrendering to God? And maybe you could read it that way. But the way that I understand that text is it's more like what Hoda's saying. It's more like in the face of such awesomeness, he feels so, he like, completely becomes aware of his sense of unworthiness and he just he just like melts into the floor basically he collapses he says i think the words like i'm undone (laughs) if i remember the scripture correctly and yeah it can feel like that sometimes when reality hits you like that like i'm undone what that's it collapse Mm. i feel like it also has to do with like what lexi was talking about of like weaving your own personal will with the will of the divine you know what i mean because there is like a weaving that needs to happen with that and so i feel like maybe collapse is when you like it's kind of like when i mean for me there have been circumstances in my life where my reality is like mirroring something back to me and i'm like oh so you're telling me that like I have to accept my circumstances like I can't change them. Even if I want to. So there's like a part of that where it's like. Like I just I remember like having these moments where like it occurred to me like I would go to like read tarot for myself and I would like be asking like okay, what do I do? And like, I guess the answer that I, that I kept receiving was like, what do you want to do? It's not about like, like what stuff, like what the divine or like what God wants you to do. It's like, what do you want? Like there was just this whole, like I would just sit down and read tarot. I was like, what do you want? Like you also like you're part of this, like you're co-creating. It's not just like, you know what I mean? I just remember that like being a, a, a big thing for me. Yeah. It's like, you also, you have to get, it's not just like, there's a personal, I guess what I'm speaking to is like, there's like a personal responsibility involved. And I love what Hoda said about like, 
there's like a certain amount of clarity that's needed. Like you can't just be like, okay, like whatever you want me to do. It's like, yeah, there's like a conversation that's happening. And like you're contributing to the conversation too. Yeah, and I wanted to say thank you for speaking to that because I feel like what it alludes to is like, gosh, it could, I don't know, because I'm getting so many different metaphysical notes on this and I guess I'll phrase it as a question. It makes me wonder if there's, um, yeah, like in what you said, I'm kind of wondering if there's, if that personal responsibility piece is is what makes it or that that relationship with the divine collaborative. And because I, I also feel like what you're speaking to, I can relate to as well in the sense of like wanting the divine to like give you or give any person the clarity that they need or like the right place to like surrender. Like I've, I've been in moments of prayer where I'm like, just show me what to do, God. And mm -hmm. what I, my, yeah. And like my sense of the divine is like, well, what exactly that? Like, well, what do you want to do? Yeah. And it kind of, it kind of opens up another pathway is, is what I'm hearing to have more, I guess, like clarity at one's disposal or like exercise the right of finding clarity as opposed to having clarity mm -hmm. imposed upon you. Because I'm like, then, yeah. then what kind of, what kind of collaboration would that be if it was just like, assignments that you take from the divine you know period <laughs> period and it's like actually actually it's like a certain part of me it's like that would be easier like can you just tell me what to do mm -hmm. like and it's like no you don't you don't get to not decide mm. like there's no way out of that <laughs> yep was like the the message that I kept receiving. Like, there's not a way where you can just like get out of like having to find clarity on like what you want in life. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh man, like, could somebody else just tell me what to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm I'm over here just nodding. Like, yeah, I have felt this way too so many times. <laughs> Like, somebody just tell me what decision to make. I <laughs> but. Mm. I, would, I would definitely agree with just everything that was just said. Um, and this is, and this is, this is why I've stopped asking questions uh, when I do divination. Um, you know, I just um, do divination. Um, as a as a means to determine what archetypes are at play right and once i determine what archetypes are coming up um then i can learn how to move with them um rather than like you know what should i do today or you know what what you know the path should i take or you know very specific sort of um detailed questions like that and just sort of finding out what's what's coming up um for myself in that moment um and then uh, additionally on top of that too um this whole concept of of finding um power and surrender this is reminding me a lot of the conversation again that we had about the clown where um <laughs> you find power in that in in the adoption of um the appearance or the actions or whatever of the fool and the clown and, and how language has sort of changed over time. Right. And, and the clown has become perceived as something inherently negative. Whereas with surrender, we've now defined it as powerlessness, right? Inherently, like if you're surrendering to something, there's no power in that you've been beaten or something like that. Right. Whereas, you know, that there, there is a lot of, um a power in in certain forms of surrender and our language has sort of negated that experience because of the way that we talk about it in in language right 
I'm really glad you're bringing in this piece of surrender, actually. And I see Hoda here also commenting on like, ooh, the surrender. Like, what is this relationship between surrender and powerlessness? And I also think this is relevant because I, I, when I was thinking about this as a potential topic for today, I looked up the etymology um, of surrender. And yeah, I mean, it's a martial term. It comes from, I think it's a, it was an old French or old English or old French, then old English. But it really is about like, um, you know, giving something over to the enemy combatant is at least the origin of this word. And so interesting that you do see this word, which appears to have a martial sort of genesis in spirituality conversations. And yeah, what is that relationship? Because I don't think it's necessarily powerlessness, but there is an element of it. It's, a, it's, a, it's very paradoxical. I think Julie is also mentioning some things that maybe, I don't know, Julie, if, you, if this feels like a good time to bring in some of what you're talking about, this paradox. Uh, Julie says, like you said, it'd be easier to have assignments from the creator and be like, I like Captain, instead of infusing our own responsibility into it, which, in my experience, also infuses experiences or situation that naturally conveys a loss of control. Mm. Wow. Yeah, where if we weren't to infuse our responsibility, it'd be a more controlled environment. Thank you, Julie. That is so interesting. I'm going to sit with that. But yeah, there's a lot of paradox. That's what I'm feeling. That's what I'm feeling right now. This paradox of like finding some sense of power in the powerlessness of a surrender. And here, the same thing, this sort of paradoxical nature of wanting to give up control, but simultaneously then desiring more control or having a more controlled environment i i having an environment that's safe because it's controlled by a higher divine power and we don't yeah have well to. it's yeah. sorry it's kind of like it's kind of like um well if you're if you are clear about your desire and you are like moving towards it right then you have to account for the possibility that it's not going to be fulfilled. And that requires being out of control. Like that feels like being out of control, I think, for a lot of people. So I think for a lot of people, it's easier to just be like, I'm confused. I don't know. Because you don't have to face the possibility of not like of not getting what you want and like the grief that that would entail. Oh, wow. Wow. And I've never thought of it that way. That is a really interesting perspective. This idea that like, actually, yeah, you're just playing it super, super safe. There's a part of you that's maybe holding back, expressing a desire with the sort of automatic belief that it won't be fulfilled. Interesting. Yeah, because it's like, well, what happens if I say this out loud? What if I don't get it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you ha we have to face that when we are clear about our desires, we have to face that possibility. Mm. Mm. and we have to really face the possibility of being wrong i think that's the other thing too that's coming up for me is like this idea of like really wanting the divine to point us in the right direction like the one i always use in my work which comes up a lot because this feeling comes up a lot too where it's like dude i just don't know what to do like someone tell me what to do and i always joke around about like you know in the old testament you've got uh god having this column of fire telling moses where to go and it's like yeah that's what i want i don't want subtlety i don't want dreams to interpret i want a column of fire telling me where to go because <laughs> it's so easy and like impossible to ignore i've but, really felt this way many times yeah but there is an abdication in that too like i think that's yeah. what we're getting 
like yeah. this ad- responsibility to like be mm-hmm. a this world. <laughs> to be a what? I didn't catch a that. A co-creator in this world, like like a fully participating co-creative force in the un- in the world, right? In, in, yeah. in our re- and not just sort of, you know, taking stage direction. Although I, right. I prefer to see some stage direction sometime. I'd love to get some notes from the director, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, <laughs> doesn't always work that way. Mm. Are there... It's funny, I feel like a lot of the prophets, you know, we talked about some of these prophets already, like Jonah, Isaiah, Moses. I feel like they're actually not helpful archetypes for some of what we're talking about. I mean, they're helpful in some ways, right? So don't get me wrong. Um, but I think in all those cases, their archetypes are really pointing us to like the, the, the risks and the dangers of not taking your calling. But what about archetypes where the calling is not in your face, isn't a burning bush telling you what to do, right? It's sort of this nagging suspicion that maybe you're doing stuff that's out of alignment. And there's no big, bold, you know, thing, no uh, chariot being carried to the heavens that's going to reveal the big thing that you got to do. And instead, you have to do this horrible grunt work of figuring out what this calling even is, uh, let alone resist it, right? And so it's an interesting question of, like, what are some archetypes that are interesting or that are helpful in this sort of this work of, like, figuring out your own desires and finding that 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 beautiful like how lexi put it this weaving between like all right let me let let me do my part and then let the divine do their part and let us work together i just think it's like really interesting that like i I don't know i'm not i'm not sure if i'm going to be able to put it into words but it's just occurring to me in this moment how like the stories from the old testament have this like really kind of like in your face obvious vibe to them like i feel like there's i feel like there's just like something kind of like hmm what's going on there you know like uh i don't mm. know like what is what is that like uh orientation towards like the relationship with god or with divine that like i don't know there's something kind of tricky about that for me (laughs) like i don't know if i like it as a blueprint (laughs) something feels like it's missing i feel you for me really personally (laughs) yeah i'm feeling into something like that too i uh it's a really interesting question to sit with, though. Like, I'm going to let that sit, but I, yeah, I think I know what you're saying exactly. Hmm. Yeah, the idea that the divine, Hoda says, the, d- the idea that the divine is beyond us. Yeah, that it's like a separate thing. Because mm. I'm like, even <laughs> like, amounting to separation wounding, in my opinion, Hoda says. Ooh. Yeah, because it's like, even the idea of like a stage director or something. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's really interesting. And I think even like, I like what you're saying though, like the separation wounding that Hoda mentioned, I feel like that, yeah, like a man behind the curtain vibe. Yeah. And it's sort of fun. Like even going back to that example from scripture with Isaiah, where he's just like undone as he says, he can't really go forward until an angel comes and puts the coal, puts a hot burning coal, which doesn't feel hot to his, on his lips. So sort of as a cleansing ritual, right? The angel is like this intermediary um, that's delivering this message of like, hey, you're now hygienic to be in the presence of God. And now he's like, okay, right? And so, yes, Hoda says, ooh, intercept, intercessory archetype feels so alive right now too. Yeah, and that angel is playing that intercessory archetype role, right? And that's allowing him to then go forward. Like you said, to bridge the separation between him and God, there's this archetype that's helping him carry across through both his collapse, sort of expressing his um, humility, and really just the sense of fear too, frankly. And then the angel bringing them back together. Um, 
Wow. But that is really interesting, Anna, this separation piece. And you're right. The Bible, a lot of the archetypes there are that piece. And the angels are often the intercessory archetypes. They often play that role. Very interesting. I also want to go back up to something that Psychonaut said, which was he thought the hangman was a really good archetype, actually, for surrender. Um, that isn't maybe playing to some of these same themes that we're talking about. And I, I have to agree. The hangman was one of the first archetypes I like fell in love with with the tarot. Um, and I do think he is saying something really interesting about surrender with just the way that he is posed, with the way that he is finding this sense of an enlightened perspective amidst sort of what appears to be, you know, taking the punishment for something that maybe he either agrees with the punishment or maybe he sort of knows what's happening and is taking his lumps so to speak, with uh, with a renewed sense of understanding of the deeper things happening. It's interesting, too, um, specifically in regards to the hanged man. Um, I don't know what the origins of this symbolism are, um, but the hanged man has always reminded me of Odin, um, <clears throat> who um, hangs himself upside down um, from... Um, Idrisil and impales himself with a, with a spear, right? And <clears throat> is sort of existing in um, a state between, you know, different worlds. Um, and he does this in order to um, gain the, um, the ruins, um, the knowledge of the ruins, right? And, and through that, um, you know, the wisdom and the knowledge of all of this too. Um, so these, you know, while we're talking about this in, um, uh, this Abrahamic sense, um, this certainly exists within, um, and transcends a lot of different traditions. Um, this, uh, sacrifice, surrender, all of these different things in the name of the pursuit of power and the name of the pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, um, et cetera. Um, and, um, these yeah, these the all of these experiences are are, are um, very universal, um, mm. and it just sort of begs the question even more of how this modern imposition of surrender as loss um, took hold, took shape, you know, and how we can get back this other context, right? Mm. Yes, I love this idea of like, how do we get back this fuller context of surrender and not just the loss? But I'm also seeing some really interesting things in the chat about Odin. Seems like as soon as you mentioned Odin, as soon as Odin ended up in this container, I felt like a little buzzing. So I'm wondering if anyone who's in the chat or in the group wants to say anything more about Odin while, while, uh, while he's with us. <laughs> he does remove his eye as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to speak to that psychonaut. I was um, watching something this weekend where Odin came up, and specifically, I was reminded about that aspect of sacrifice, um, where he sacrifices his eye or um, his vision in order to obtain the wisdom of the runes, and sort of to me, stand, stands as an archetype of, um, yeah, I think powerfully said like the way that psychonaut um laid that out as a as an extension of the archetype of the hangman or this idea mm -hmm. that um that you can kind of or like one can tune into the relationship that they have with the divine and kind of play the role of their own intercessory is kind of what i'm getting from this like this idea that the person themselves the body itself is um a medium to connect with the divine and i'm not saying that comes from odin himself but i think that that soul grouping without getting too vast i think that that particular soul grouping does have um wisdom and i think um that those lineages connected to o odin um are i think related to um understanding and like measuring 
which circumstances require sacrifice, which cir- circumstances require surrender. Um, and I know Lexi refers to Odin as like sky father, like one of the sky fathers, like with Zeus, I think of Zeus as a sky father as well, um, mm. who are like figures. Yeah, like these archetypes of, I, I would even say like divine timing, because I think that that is kind of the wheel that our consciousness um, turns on in order to determine what is the, what what action, what sort of collaboration does it take to approach a circum- certain circumstance um, at any given time. Um, yeah, and I see Lexi saying that she loves Horus, or like she brings up Horus and Tengri. Um, and I think that there are a lot of um, archetypes that speak to yeah, that work of of being one's own intercessory or taking on the role of the medium. Mm. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also just like for finding myself really sitting longer with also like the why of the surrender. And I'm finding it really interesting that like you both touched on Odin's why having to do with knowledge. And I think Hoda, maybe I'm I'm wrong, but I kind of felt like there was some drawing attention to like using that knowledge to have a greater sense of sort of um I guess the bigger picture to move appropriately in the world. But yeah, it's an interesting thing to like think about the because then it, it, it kind of brings in that 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 element of like w- the why of the surrenders are very different depending on the archetypes, right? Like some of them we were saying in the Old Testament, they were surrendering because they almost felt like they collapsed almost potentially, right? And in this case, we're talking about a surrender, but there's a very specific fruit that he's going for, right? There's a very specific outcome that he's trying to achieve and he sees surrender as his way to it. And now that's really a different kind of archetype. Hmm. And I also think it's interesting that like both of you or many of you have brought in this interesting overlap, though I don't think perfectly overlapping, this sort of Venn diagram overlap of sacrifice and surrender. And that I think is really interesting. Because they're not it's quite all- the same. Yeah, please, Psychonaut, please. It's also worth noting, too, that this this story of Odin removing his eye <clears throat> is actually a different instance. Um, so you have him hanging himself upside down, stabbing himself with a spear, and then in a totally unrelated story, still in the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom, um, he is now plucking out his own eye, sort of doubling down in two separate instances on this concept. Um, the removal of the eye being to drink from um, a fountain of wisdom, which again, we bringing in this concept of water being this intermediary, right? The in between, um, as as something sort of not of the material realm, right? Um, mm. Something else, um, but yeah, certainly, you know, over and over again. <laughs> wow, yeah, I love what you said about like the water going like. You didn't use the word, but it it made me think of like the sort of archetype of the primordial waters and their relationship with like the actual water that we kind of know. Um, I love that you're bringing that in. Like, and so Hoda mentioned, I I can't believe we haven't brought up, talked about Jesus yet. And um, that was who I I came up with in the shower. So that was who I had in mind. Maybe you're, you're feeling that, but I wanted to let this ride, but yeah. I mean, Jesus, of course, is one of the most um, certainly influential archetypes that relate to themes of surrender and sacrifice. Um, And also has this sort of um, hanging on wood sort of resonance, too, with with Odin's story that we're talking about right now. Mm. Ooh. Hoda says, reminds me of a part in the mysticism of sound and music where Hazrat Inyat Khan speaks to water being an announcement of the ethers, but not the ethers itself. My, her paraphrasing. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they're like, it's like the water is like a pattern of the ether that, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And so it actually kind of almost feels like this archetype, like what you're talking about, too, Psycho, not like this archetypal bridge that we've been talking about, this intercessory nature, which is funny because I think this is also related to the Jesus story since we brought Jesus in, or I did, with baptism, right? That the baptism is what sets off Jesus' ministry. At least if you go by, I guess I'm talking about, I'll be honest, whenever I talk about Jesus still, I'm still mostly just talking about the Gospels Jesus, which I will want to separate out from like the actual uh, man, Yeshua. And I know that a lot of people have lots of really interesting gnosis about, about that. And I don't want to downplay all of the beautiful gnosis around the actual Yeshua and around a lot of things. Uh, around that were taken out of the gospels so i just want to be honest that a lot of when i talk about jesus it is speaking about this sort of the the christ archetype from the gospels um but i really appreciate anyone bringing in other things from their own gnosis or other traditions that make sense i just wanted to kind of give that caveat um yes i mean not even just jesus but even before that in the abrahamic tradition what is the in between mm. The living waters. Yes, you're right. And Hoda says, do you want to say more about Christ as a figure of sacrifice and surrender? Yeah. I mean, the sacrifice thing is really interesting because he, you know, obviously what comes out of um, Christianity is this theology that he died on the cross for other people's sins, right? That's like the, the, a lot of the general gestalt. A lot of that language I don't really see in scripture. I don't see it in the gospels. I don't see Jesus really using that language necessarily. Um, but it's definitely a sacrifice. And for me, the sacrifice surrender overlap with Jesus is kind of speaking to actually a lot to do with Jonah. Like to me, Jesus is like the opposite of Jonah in that he never questions his what he perceives as his calling. In the gospels, he has this mission that he's sent to do. And at different times, you get the sense that he doesn't really actually even, he's not thrilled about it. Like, he's pretty clear about that. Like, if someone can take this cup from me, please do. <laughs> like, he doesn't really want to do it necessarily, but he's 100% committed to it all the same. Like, that's where I think the humanity sneaks out, where the humanity is like, I don't want to do this. But that other piece comes in where he, it, there's like, it's kind of like Lexi said, this braiding of, God's will and, and his will, to me, that's what I think the, the Jesus of the Gospels is telling us of how to do this. Like, it's not easy. He's not happy about it, but he spends a lot of time in prayer. He spends a lot of time with others talking about it, and he holds fast to it and trusts that this mission that he's being sent to do is something of worthwhile because it's a calling on his heart that he comes here with. And so he follows it. And I do think there's something really powerful in that story. Dude, oddly hearing these Beyonce lyrics right now, I didn't want this power, and I did not sing it, so I'm sorry. Please feel free, Hoda, to come off mute and put some Beyonce in here. I feel like that always adds to the container. I won't do the song justice at all, but I did want to bring in those lyrics. They were just coming up for me as you were speaking to, like, that, um, the difference and, like, the polarization of, of um, let's say, like, the story of Jonah, where one figure, we see a figure who's kind of resistant to their calling and then Christ who's like a figure who um, can't resist his calling. But he also realizes from what I remember, especially like the Christ of the gospels um, is a figure who's resistant to it, but is called to it in almost every single moment. And mm -hmm. um, cause this could, this could be like six different other archetypal hours, right? Yeah. Or at least yeah. like, yeah. Like how do you respond to your calling? Um, the figure of the prophet, how do you determine? There's so many different avenues, but I do feel, um, yeah, like I appreciate that braiding and that weaving of the fact that Christ is an emblematic figure that speaks to um, when service and sacrifice, I would even say service and surrender aren't an option. Whereas for most people, or like when I think of the collective consciousness, 
most people um, are probably weighing out um, whether or not they have to do that at all. Whereas I feel like these archetypical intercessory figures speak to that point where that is part of someone's mission or like that point in the path where one does connect to the divine and like contractually agrees to not have to decide whether or not surrender and um wow like my feet are buzzing right now where Mm. they don't have to decide whether or not service and surrender is a choice but they contractually agree with the divine that that is the the only way to live I guess you can say without without conflating too much of that story or making it seem like it's something that we have to personally take on um it just feels like something that's emblematic from from these stories that are coming out today for me Mm. Yes. Can I, you don't have to answer this because it's very personal to your own intuitive operating system, cheekily said, but the feet buzzing, like, what do you make of that in this particular context? I would say for me, like having this conversation, especially because um, a lot of my work is steeped in like remembering these lineages. I feel like my feet buzzing probably speaks to um, some sort of energetic transmission that's happening right now that, yeah, that kind of relays symbolically that um, the act of remembering these lineages um, and the the weavings, especially since we were talking about weaving earlier, how these weavings are, um, which I talk about a lot, right? Like these weavings are still alive in the subconscious, tapestry of our human experience so even if somebody has never heard about christ and has never heard about christ in the gospels or has never heard about the hanged man i think that some of the symbols that we've exchanged today um yeah my feet is my feet are buzzing again as i say this um i think that it it's speaking to symbolically how um yeah like what i would call remembering is probably happening right now um across time Yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's really beautiful. And I do, I do also really love like, for some reason, yeah, the two words that are coming in the strongest for me as I'm just sitting with this is this remembrance or remembering and weaving and the beautiful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Thank you. And you are right that there's like, I feel like we've opened up like, about six different can of worms that could be fully fleshed out containers. And I do see that we are kind of running at it at our time. And so I do want to wonder like, yeah, you use the word portals in the chat, Hoda, but like, yeah, what doorways, what portals are you sensing into for yourself this week? Maybe that are coming up this morning or, could be cool to think about as future conversations here on the Broom Radio um, or in the, in the server. Yeah, so feel free to come off of mute or share in the chat anything that comes up for you as like what feels like an interesting doorway that you're feeling a tug towards this week or for a future conversation. Planting season, baby. Yes. Psychonaut. Thank you for bringing in that farming perspective. When the literal and and the figurative overlap beautifully. Hmm. Yeah, that's another way to put it, too. It's like, are there any seeds that you're sensing from this conversation? Or on this idea of, like, yeah anything that we've talked about, but I think certainly we've spent a lot of time on surrender and in the beginning, a lot of time on this, this sort of passageway of the guiding star. And so there's a theme there too, sort of this passageway, but also this intercessory, right? Our types of, and the bridging and the weaving, like, yeah, there's a lot of overlap actually. I'm just kind of spitballing some of the things coming up for me. Hoda says, I feel a tug towards picking up scripture. 
I also feel a call to explore what it feels like to exist in a state of surrender as a way of being, which feels like a tall order, but I'm open to it. Beautiful. Amen. Mm. Yeah, I've thought about the scripture thing too. It's been a while, but today was the first time I felt the sense to pick it up again too, because I was finding myself asking questions. It's like, hmm, maybe it is time to go back in for a little bit. And for me, it's always the Gospels I want to go back to. <laughs> they're, they're my favorite part. Anyone else have things that came up for them or things they might feel, feel into this week? I'll admit too, I feel slightly like there's still some openness for me. Like I feel good about closing the container soon, but I do feel like there's some some bits that feel a little bit like, ooh, that feels a little like there was more there. Especially around I think like these archetypes of like other archetypes of surrender that feel like useful. Or even other archetypes of sacrifice that feel like especially useful for us to look at or for us to bring in a new perspective that maybe some of these Abrahamic ones and even like Odin that we've talked about or the hangman are not like, those are great, all great, but I'm like, part of me is feeling like there's a little bit there still. And I'm okay on time actually, if there are, if there is interest. Psychonaut says, our talk on Odin reminded me of the nine herbs charm. Hmm. And I'm reflecting on the possibility of an, of a herbal, medicine tradition within germanic and indigenous european work wow that sounds really interesting anything more you want to share on that psychonaut wow so um my um my background is far more in um celtic mythology um than germanic um but the nine herbs charm is um an Anglo-Saxon um, record in 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 a uh, story in regards to Odin, um, in which there was nine different herbs that were thought to have magical properties to them, and my impression is that it it's not well understood or known what those herbs um, were supposed to be. However, there's been a lot of speculation and translation over time. Um, looking at a list right now, and this particular author posits that it was mugwort, plantain, lamb's crest, betony, b e t o n y, chamomile, nettle, crab apple, thyme, and fennel. Um, and I'm familiar with some of these, um, lamb's crest and this other one I don't know how to say. I'm obviously not as familiar with. Um, but I do know that a lot of these do have medicinal properties. And um, it's interesting that we're, t we're talking about planting season, right, coming into spring. And the opportunity um, to start cultivating these things is is likely what brought this in combination with our talk on Odin. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on this because um, it would certainly it would certainly be interesting um, this story also contains a lot of anecdotes about how to increase the magical potential of um, these um, herbal substances as well. Um, but I think I think that uh, some sort of a you know herbal healing tradition um, could in fact be very possible um, using this as um, sort of a genesis point for that. I love that, and I also. I don't know why I got the feeling like, do you think it'd be fun or interesting to you, Psychonaut, to like think of what your own nine herbs might be? Like if you were to make a charm of nine herbs that feel especially potent or useful to you, like does that feel like it could be an interesting exercise to play with? And no worries if not, of course. 
And yeah, I'm also like really tuning into nine too. That feels really important to it also, the number nine. I mean, if Psychonaut isn't into it, I certainly am. <laughs> yeah. Do you, any, uh, <laughs> that, it, I think maybe that could be something we share in Alter Light. Did, did we come up with our nine herb charms that <laughs> I think you could do it with a lot? I feel like it, it'll take me years, but yeah. <laughs> I will... Um consult uh, my Germanic friend on this topic and perhaps there's more <laughs> speculation out there about more herbs that could be included in such a tradition and then I'll post about it in the um, TC thread and we can have we can have a more informed conversation about the topic let's say <laughs> I also feel like some of those herbs have come up in uh Hoda's lineage space Iyaga before. Like I feel like we we've talked about fennel. And there was another at mugwort, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Hoda says big womb medicine, I feel. Mm -hmm. Fennel we're talking about is the big womb? Or uh -huh. nine is the number of the goddess. Uh-huh. Wow, I love fennel. Fennel, wow. I don't know why. That one just for right now. I'm just thinking about how powerful fennel feels to me. Nine is the number of the goddess. Yeah, you know it's so funny too because like I feel like I saw someone on TikTok too like deciding they wanted to just like go after this uh, you know sort of stereotypical evangelical christian from america about witches and he was like dude he was just like listen witches are really just herbalists and so he was just going in on on the power of herbs and, and all of this and uh i don't know something about that i think the way that we were combining the herbs with the power of the goddess reminded me of that i don't know if people other else might resonate with the importance of herbalism to witchcraft yeah earth magicians basically hoda says yeah yeah and yeah because i think also because you were talking about it really second up from like the magical properties that arise from these herbs and from the unique combinations or there's other things you can sort of add or other things you can do with the herbs to draw out their magical properties further or their healing properties that's really cool though that sounds really exciting i'll i look forward to hearing more about that Lexi says, I feel like the getting clarity aspect is a helpful reminder for me. Yes. Yes. Reclaiming the will to live as a focus for the lifetime. Wow. Yeah. I don't know why. For some reason, I just like th thought it was interesting. I don't know what, I don't know if this is actually accurate to the story. Psycho not or to others correct me, but like something about getting clarity it made me think of like, if I heard correctly, it sounded like Odin lost his eye almost to gain more clarity in a different way. If that's was a mystery, let me know, let me know. But if I like, I sort of like was holding that paradox in my mind that came up when I read that. Like, how interesting! Like, he gained more clarity through the loss of an eye. <laughs> gained like, more vision through the loss of an eye. Yeah, like that's there's something yep. really feel. I don't know. It just feels really potent to be that paradox. Hmm. Hmm. Poppy O has cosmic secrets. <laughs> For real. Poppy O. Yes. Yes, we can. So I think this is a good place to, to end off for uh for this container. I want to thank you all so much for this space and for giving us all some juicy stuff to think about this week. And um, yeah, I hope to see y'all uh, next time around. And to anyone listening to this, please feel free to join in or share um, any comments wherever you're hearing this or in the Discord server. 
Thank you all.